um, including uh, my co-chair, Senator Limon, that is focused on what we can do to support California students. Uh, we know that inclusive education works. We know that it has positive benefits for our students. And we know, and we've known for a long time, that when students see themselves in the materials that they read, that they do better academically and socially. And so today's hearing is focused on the topic of diversifying our textbooks. Um, in a moment, you'll hear from um, my co-chair and our colleagues, but I want to quickly acknowledge some textbook publishers, companies that are in the room who uh, stepped forward to be a part of this conversation. Um, and I have to say, um, unlike some of the other companies who they're kind of running from this conversation, and instead of recognizing that this is a moment to embrace helping California students, that when students learn about their own stories, when they learn about the experience of others that they can um, uh, relate to, it has a very, very positive and profound effect. And we think it has a great effect on the bottom line of the companies. And so I just want to shout them out while they're here today. We're going to hear from them in testimony. You might only get three to four minutes, but uh, I'm sure our colleagues will ask you a lot of questions so that you can amplify a lot of the points that you want to make. Uh, but I do want to just quickly call out the companies and if the representatives want to stand and we'll acknowledge you. Uh, we have today uh, from C CPM Educational Programs here today. Um, welcome. We're glad that you are here. Thank you. Um, we have from Benchmark Education, uh, Kimberly Plummer is here. Thank you. And that was, that was Elizabeth Coiner from uh, uh, CPM Education. We have the College Board here today, Gregory Walker, Douglas Waugh, Lori O'Day. Thank you, College Board. Um, and we have Studies Weekly here, and they have a whole team. Uh, John McCurdy, Dr. Noel Carter, uh, Chris Gillespie, David Bagley, Rob Vicario, Frank PC, sorry if we miss anyone. We're really glad that you were here. Let's give all the publishers a round of applause um, for coming forward. I, I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, I'm just being candid. There are a lot who were invited, and many were just squeamish about showing up here today. And there's nothing here that's going to hurt anyone. Actually, everything here is going to help, and we're grateful that you're here today. Uh, so welcome. Um, we're going to get underway, and I'd like to turn it now to my colleagues for some open remarks, and then we'll hear from all of our witnesses. Um, uh, first, our co-chair, Senator Limon. Thank you so much uh, to our superintendent of public instruction. Uh, Senator Limon, representing uh, Santa Barbara and Ventura counties, but previously served as a school board member um, for a K through 12 school district and also spent 14 years working in higher ed. So this has been, uh, you know, the literature um, and exclusions of literature regrettably are part of history. Um, they uh, are not something that is new. Um, to 2023, but certainly have been a very important um, piece of reflection for all of us. And we're here today um, to ensure that the mistakes of the past um, are not the mistakes of the future in terms of how we think of literature and um, the important roles that literature and books um, and curriculum play in a inclusive, comprehensive education for California students. So thank you so much for su uh, to Superintendent uh, Tony Thurman for convening us and to our colleagues who are all, you know, coming in and out today, but who are vested in this particular issue and ensuring that California students have a, a curriculum, coursework, textbooks that are reflective of the comprehensive education that we aim to uh, provide to students, really not just in K through 12, but in higher ed as well. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lamone. It's an uh, honor always to work with you, especially on the legislation that you brought forward to support um, diversity in our uh, school curriculums and working with Native American students and working with students of color, bilingual education. Thank you for all of your leadership. I'm going to keep moving to our right, but while we're doing that, I want to ask uh, Dr. Joe Johnson, one of our witnesses, if he'd come to the witness table um, in a moment after the legislators have spoken. I'm going to ask Dr. Johnson, you can come forward just to um, set the stage for us a little bit about why we are here, why this is important. Just a few remarks to help us uh, set the stage for our conversation. Uh, no stranger to this work uh, uh, from District 51, Assemblymember uh, Rick Chavez Zaburg, who's been just an incredible champion uh, on, on work to keep students safe, to support LGBTQ plus students. Um, uh, I'll let him tell you, but it's been an honor to work with you, uh, Assemblymember Zaburg. 
Thank you, Superintendent Thurman. Thank you for having me today and including me in this really important task force. I'd like to thank you for your many, many years of standing up for our most vulnerable students, including LGBTQ students. And uh, I follow in your footsteps in many of the initiatives that we started when I was at Equality California. Um, you know, we're here today to address the challenges faced by students who don't see themselves represented in the lessons taught in our schools and the stories told in our textbooks. These include students from communities of color, youth from immigrant communities, students with disabilities, LGBTQ plus students, and more. And generally, these students face lower success rates. LGBTQ plus students who were targeted because of their sexual orientation missed school nearly three times more often, had lower GPAs, were less likely to pursue post-secondary education, were twice as likely to have been disciplined at school, had lower self-esteem, and had higher levels of depression and suicide ideation than their peers. That number is even greater for LGBTQ youth who are also targeted because of their race, their immigration status, their zip code, religion, or ability. Schools play a crucial role in supporting these students who may lack acceptance at home and in their communities. So these initiatives that we'll be talking about today promote inclusivity, diversity, and accurate representation contributing to a more accepting and inclusive learning environments. However, school boards in many cases are facing challenges and protests against inclusive curriculum, and that's exactly why the existence of this task force re reflects the reality that oversight in curriculum implementation is needed. Oversight of curriculum implementation is critical to ensure that all students are seen, respected, and valued, and representation of youth who may feel that they are alone and that that needs to be included in our textbooks. Um, uh, LB, LGBTQ plus inclusive curriculum helps students feel seen, valued, and respected, and it also benefits non-LGBTQ students by fostering understanding, empathy, and acceptance. Holocaust education, anti-Semitism education, get the curriculum that focuses on the contributions of members of communities of color, religious minorities, and women are similarly critical. You know, I didn't have the opportunity as a child or a young man to see representation around me. That's why um, I fought to create a better, kinder, and more compassionate world for LGBTQ plus and all people. Um, and that's why I'm so grateful for the leadership of uh, Superintendent Thurman and Senator Lamone and my colleagues here on the task force who have been actually looking uh, and working on these issues. In fact, during my time at Equality California, we proudly supported the Fair Education Act, which required the updating of social science and history curriculum we also supported comprehensive and inclusive approach to sexual health education. I remember when I was at Equality California, we literally reviewed hundreds and hundreds of textbooks, textbooks that were focused on every grade level all the way from pre-K through, uh, through 12th grade and really looked at the differences that, um, that textbooks um, had um, and how, how the extent to which they represented California values. So I'm happy. Um, Really grateful for the textbook manufacturers that are here today. Um, what you will do, I think, can make a real difference in, in, in the lives of kids in our, um, in our state um, and in our country because um, we know that the textbooks that you, that you sell here in California will also be sold in states across the country. So it's really important that we get this right, and this is about making sure that our kids are seen and that they actually can achieve the California dream and ultimately the American dream. So thank you very much, Superintendent Thurman, for bringing us all together today. Thank you, Assembly Members Burr. And, and moving to the 60th Assembly District, we'd love to hear from Assembly Member Corey Jackson, who has shared with us earlier this morning his great work to address inclusion in education. Assembly Member Dr. Corey Jackson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Superintendent. It's indeed an honor to uh, be here and to serve on this uh, task force. Um, it is becoming increasingly clear over the years how important um, the knowledge that we disseminate uh, to our children and consume um, our, to each other um, is, is really uh, something that we have to put in the sacred care category, uh, which also uh, ensures that people understand and even our publishers understand the sacred responsibility about what you put in your books, the sacred responsibility to understand that uh, what is in those books 
is critical uh, to the very uh, functioning of our society. And when we are consuming information from different sources, then we begin to argue about what the facts are, what the real history is. And when that happens, it puts people in danger. It puts children in danger. It puts the most historically marginalized and oppressed populations in this, nature, in this nation in danger. And it's time that we get it right. And it's time that we uh, even put more responsibility on one another to ensuring that we get this right and that we protect the true history, the true representation of Californians and their ancestry. Uh, so it is my hope that we, can con that we continue to amplify this message, uh, that we continue to uh, raise our voices um, in ensuring that we hold people accountable uh, for uh, what is done. I, ha I never had a clue uh, that uh, publishers even um, had the right to decide uh, how to represent um, our history. Uh, we saw that we started to change the story of Rosa Parks. We started to change some of the most iconic uh, history that is the cornerstone um, of what uh, justice and fairness is um, and how we can atone uh, for the dark past um, of this nation. Um, and so uh, the various bills, including my bill, AB 1078, is uh, central to making sure uh, that we are rise, raising these issues to a whole nother level of accountability, a whole nother level um, of responsibility to ensuring that we get this right, and most importantly, uh, making sure that even the darkest movements that are arising in this nation um, are kept at bay um, and, quite frankly, pushed back into the shadows where they belong. Thank you very much, Mr. Superintendent. Thank you, Assembly Member Dr. Jackson, and thank you for your leadership on the bill as well. Uh, we're in the Senate, so let's continue in the Senate. Uh, we'll go to the mighty 28th District and hear from an incredible champion, Senator uh, Lola smallwood Cuevas. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Superintendent. And it is a real honor for me to be here, uh, to be in this conversation with you, shaping the next generation of leaders, the next generation of elected officials, the next generation of doctors, lawyers, construction workers, folks who will drive California's democracy. Uh, and the first element for democracy is education, making sure folks have the tools to be able to understand the world within, with, within they live and to be able to have discernment and make decisions that govern the direction that this great state and this great nation will go in. I am so honored to represent the 28th District, uh, the heart and soul of LA County. I'm so honored to sit on uh, the California Education Committee. I'm so honored to represent my district on Budget Sub 1, where we make the decisions about where our dollars get spent to ensure that this state that has made a dramatic and critical priority of education since its inception, building one of the greatest education systems in the world, leading the way um, from K through 12 to higher ed, um, that we have the right tools uh, for that system to do the work that we need to get done. Uh, at just our community colleges alone, I think we were spending upwards of about $115 million on textbooks. When we go back to K through 12, we go back, we think about, you know, now we've got our transitional <laughs> kindergarten. We're trying to begin that process of preparing our early readers. Just working back from our higher ed to our um, early childhood, California is at a tremendous crossroads. Um, and 
I think uh, the great assembly member from uh, San Bernardino County pointed out that this is really sacred work. Um, in 2045, the entire nation will have a people of color majority that pretty much looks like folks on this dais. Black, brown, people of color will be the majority of this country. California has already reached a people of color majority. It is unfortunate, but an opportunity to recognize what does it mean for communities that have been left out of opportunities, communities that uh, through our history have a very unique experience in this democracy. What does it mean for some of those very vulnerable communities that are in overlapping barriers to now be the majority of our state, the bedrock of our state? Whether our, our state wins or loses, is, it's dependent on that population. So what level of education, how much do they need to know about themselves to be able to anchor this great state and in a few years, this great nation? You all are giving those very fundamental building blocks. And if we don't have curriculum, if we don't have analysis, if we don't have the contributions of those kinds of individuals, not just to history, but to science, to mathematics, to our social enterprise, if we don't have a detailed accounting of those kinds of histories inside of our textbooks, folks will not know what real power they have. They will not see themselves in that fundamental education and therefore we will be guided by a population that does not have the sense of self and their, themselves in this democracy. And that is a very dangerous, very dangerous proposition. So I wanna say this conversation may seem sort of siloed around this conversation of what kind of textbooks, what kind of publishing, you know, all of these sort of very technical conversations, but really it is about what kind of future we're gonna have in this state and what kind of future we're gonna have in this country. So I'm honored to be on this task force. Um, I've spent a lot of time in vulnerable communities. Uh, I know I didn't learn about black history until I took ethnic studies in college, which was so tragic. But it was that education that really transformed my life and gave me a very clear understanding of what is my role in this society. So for me, I'm honored to be here. Um, thank you so much for the invitation and I look forward to the outcome of these discussions. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we're gonna go to Assemblymember Ramos and then we'll hear from Assemblymember Bonta. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Superintendent. Um, and thank you for, uh, um, putting together uh, this task force, but also to the publishers that are here to hear directly um, from the legislature and to hear um, from you um, ideas of how we can continue to move forward here in the state of California. As we shared in the press conference, we talked a little bit about the third and fourth grade curriculum when we talk about the Spanish colonization and the gold rush that if those are gonna be taught, then let's make sure that the voice of California's first people are included there, but also as embedded in the educational journey for those from the elementary to the uh, middle school to the high school. In the middle school, we talk, start to teach about the history of the state of California, that a correct portrayal um, comes forward, that it's discussed and openly discussed that the, the first governor of the state of California put out bounties on California Indian people, that then the legislature, the legislature that we currently sit in, paid for through taxpayers' dollars um, to fund those militias to go out on a killing spree um, here in the state of California that then was reimbursed by the federal government um, for that cost of those militias moving forward. And so that part of history has never been told, but it's also a chance to uh, have the voice of those um, that have been living with that history that hasn't been so open in the state of California 
to have the voices of them being at the table to create the curriculum moving forward. And also, when we get to the areas in, in high school, when we learn about government, the government system here in, in the United States and the state of California, federal level, state level, local jurisdictions, that the inclusion of, of tribal governments would be included in the, that whole well-rounded educational component. Um, we come from a, an Indian reservation. I still reside there. And we grew up um, going to the local schools um, in our area. And part of the, the distinction is that the culture is so much different here in the state of California than what the United States and others try to do by pan-Americanizing a culture into one. And so in our culture, we never, Serrano Cahuilla, we never used the drums and we never used the teepee for any of our culture. We used um, willow um, brush homes and we sing with a gourd rattle and hoofs of animals, um, elderberry flutes. So when I was in third grade and growing up on the reservation, uh, a teacher played a drum song and asked, who's Indian? We raised our hand and then quickly asked us to interpret that song. And when we said that was not our culture, we quickly were told to sit down. Maybe you're not Indian enough. And so that's the things that we're still struggling here today. That's the same things that are still going on. And our, our office got so many calls. We worked with the superintendent on the graduation regalia, being able to be worn uh, for those that are graduating. There's been two pieces of legislation, and we're probably going to have to do a third to reinforce what's already allowed in the state of California. So education um, is an area where we could start to move forward. And with the willingness of the publishers to come in and hear firsthand experiences from those, um, from the California Indian community, Indian community in general, of how we can be part of the solution to make it better. Now, those are some things that we talk about. Those are things of during the gold rush, atrocities, genocide. On um, this legislature, we moved forward to rename a school in San Francisco that took the founder's name off that created genocide and almost wiped out the Yuki Indian people. And so that's been corrected. But there's so much that still needs to be done. But also to focus on the positive things, the resiliency of California Indian people that we're still here, we're sitting in this legislature. The power, the resiliency, and the, con the, the contributions to the state of California and the nation. Many roads and highways that are now paved were once Indian trails. So giving um, that also um, within the books to add to those um, areas that have of contributions to, this, to the state of California. These are things that we've been engaged in for many years, working with the, the superintendent and colleagues on this dais. And these are things that we're going to continue to work on. I did mention that Washington State moved forward with a bill, a time immemorial bill. It took them 15 years to get this embedded in the elementary, the middle school, and the high school level. But I'm confident that the state of California, it won't take 15 years to get it there. So we did uh, move forward on a piece of legislation that the governor did sign into law that calls on um, local LEAs to form American Indian Task Force to work on the local uh, regions and the contributions here in this area. This is Miwat, Nisanan, Paduan people that are here. Different culture than maybe an hour down the road, each with a different language, each with a different culture and history. And so that still needs to be accepted, but the voice of the Indian people should be at the table. It shouldn't be more of a paternal approach, which what we've seen in books is as those deciding what history was and being taught to those in the state of California and the nation on here's what we're saying your history is. Now you have to accept it. No longer are we accepting it. That's why this task force is so important that now we're able to counter that with um, being able to have that voice moving forward. And so it's so important for that to happen. And, and it's true that once you get out of the, the K through 12 system in the community colleges, higher ed, that's when you start to learn more about the culture and history on the atrocities, assimilation, uh, the governor um, creating a, a bounties on California Indian people. And it's not so far-fetched from back in time. Just recently in 2022, we had to pass a piece of legislation to get rid of a derogatory names towards Native American women, the S word. Still in this day and age, we have to pass a piece of legislation 
to get rid of a derogatory name. And that goes back to the educational component. We can start so much and be more proactive within the educational system, within the elementary, the middle school, and the high school to start to correct some of those things from the voice of Indian people themselves and the whole community. I think we'll be so much far ahead of the curve because then you're able to have it now embedded and the true history is coming forward from the people that need to be spoken, that were left out of the equation uh, some time back. So that would be my uh, request is to include um, the voices of those to be able to be at the table to discuss the true history and culture. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Superintendent. Thank you, Assemblyman Ramos and Chair of the Great Native American Caucus and great author. Uh, thank you. We're going to hear from another great champion about equity and inclusion and protecting the rights of young people, um, uh, the great Assembly member, Mia Bata. Thank you so much, Superintendent. Um, uh, I'm very excited about the intention of this task force and the opportunity that we have before here today. I um, uh, have spent a lot of time in the study of education and one of the things that has always uh, really resonated for me is the idea about why we have public a public education system in the first place. Uh, shortly after the establishment of these United States, we knew that we needed to be able to protect uh, our ability to operate this grand experiment of democracy by ensuring that we actually generated generations of people who could engage in civic and civil discourse, uh, who would be able to go into voting booths acknowledging and knowing what they were voting about. And you cannot have civil and civic discourse without a foundational understanding of who you are. And so the idea that we are faced now uh, in this moment in time with the terrible <laughs> reality of having to remind us all as a state and as a country that we must protect our ability to be holy who ourselves, who we are in ourselves and that our children need to be raised up knowing who they are, knowing what our history is, knowing that we need to come from a place of love as a civil society and inclusion as a civil society. So uh, that is not the reality, unfortunately, that we are living in right now. But I know that this task force is gonna do something about that. I know that we have a superintendent committed to making sure uh, that we focus on inclusive practices across our 353 school boards. Uh, and I know that we have a legislature committed to promoting a progressive, small d, democratic agenda that ensures that we protect our ability to actually preserve the experiment of our democracy by representing who we are in our curriculum, our practices, our textbooks, our policies across the state of California when it comes to our schools. So thank you for including me in this task force and I'm so very much looking forward to the testimony uh, that we will be hearing today from our experts in this field. Thank you, Senator Member Bonta. We're going to um, begin to hear from some of our witnesses, for, uh, starting first with Dr. Joe Johnson, who is the founding executive director of the National Center for Urban School Transformation. He's no uh, stranger to our work here or to education. Uh, he's led incredible research on so many uh, topics about closing the opportunity gap, about supporting students of color and students from all backgrounds. If you would, could you give us two to three minutes of your thoughts about why inclusive education is important? Just center us a little bit on why this, uh, uh, this notion of diversifying textbooks would be so important. Please welcome me, Dr. Joseph Johnson. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this important conversation. Uh, I've been an educator for a long time, over 45 years. And I became an educator in part because I was appalled that in this country, one only needed to know five variables in order to predict how well anyone was going to fare in our educational system. Race, ethnicity, language background, family income, gender, gender identity, 
and zip code. If you know those five variables, you can predict far too well how well students will achieve. So in my work, I have been very deliberately looking for the exceptions to that rule. And in particular, we've been looking for schools where we see that there's no ability to predict learning outcomes or social outcomes by knowing those five variables. <coughs> We've been looking for schools all across this country where Latinx students, black students, low-income students are achieving at levels that exceed the overall population of their state. That's what the National Center for Urban School Transformation does. We're based in San Diego. We've been in operation for 18 years. We studied 171 schools that meet our very rigorous criteria. Real equity all across the board. You say, 171, that sounds like a lot. No, it isn't. There's 90,000 schools in America, right? And so I think it's appalling that we have so few schools where we see fantastic outcomes for every demographic group of students. So the question is, what is it about those schools? And I'm just going to answer very quickly because I have other wonderful uh, colleagues here at the table who have insight to share. But the first of those uh, that I want to, first concept I want to share is that in these very successful schools, it's, it's what gets taught. And so in these very successful schools, Students are achieving well because they are being taught rigorous academic standards. When we go into the advanced placement calculus class, we see black and brown and low-income children because there are many, many other places where that's not who you find in those classes. We see rigorous academic support for students starting all the way in uh, TK and, 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 and pre-K programs all the way through. So that's number one. So that's the what. But the second is, well, why? Why is it that students of color, students from low-income communities, are investing the effort, uh, putting forth the commitment to learn these challenging academic standards. And what we see and what we hear from those students, because we take the time to interview them and interview their parents, and they say, this is a school where my child is appreciated, my child is loved, my child knows that they are valued that their culture is valued, that they are respected. And I, I hear all the time people say, oh, well, that's a soft thing. No, that is the thing. Because when you take that away from children, then you take away their motivation to engage. But the third, I think, is really where this committee wants to focus because yes, there's the what, the challenging standard, and yes, there's that very central why about making our children feel valued, but there's the issue of how. How do we do that? How do we make that happen for our children? 
And so in these schools, yes, they teach the rigorous standards, but they realize that you can, you can teach almost anything, but you can teach it in a way that makes it sound foreign to children, that makes it sound unrelated to their lives. You can make it as boring as can be. Or you have an opportunity to make it such that children see those, those same rigorous standards as being closely related to them and their lives and their experience. And so I have, I've heard children talk to me, hey, we have physics happening in the ghetto. We, 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 we know about chemistry in the barrio. We, we know about these concepts and they're real to us and we can make sense of it, and we can relate it to our lives. And so when those students are saying, this is why I just got a five on the AP exam. This is why I, I'm moving forward. It's because they've had those experiences that help them relate the concepts that we know they need to learn to their lives. Now, how does that happen? Well, teachers have to find the content to make that connection, right? And, and sometimes it's not in our textbooks. Sometimes teachers will say, hey, here's how many extra hours you're spending to, to, to create these powerful lessons. And, and, and in many cases, they have found materials, such as materials that some of these, uh, these great folks here today have created. Uh, but, but there needs to be more. There's more I can say, but I'm going to stop there and, uh, and turn it back to the state superintendent. Dr. Johnson, thank you. We love the passion. Thank you for grounding us. We're, I'm going to quickly introduce our panel, and we're going to hear from them. Um, we're going to pick up the pace just a little bit. Um, we're going to hear from Dr. Karen Korematsu, who's founder and executive director of the Fred Korematsu Institute. Uh, we'll then hear uh, just a brief introduction, um, uh, brief uh, framing um, on behalf of Equality California. We have Craig uh, Pulsifer, who's going to make a few brief remarks and then be joined by Dr. Don Romsberg uh, of Sonoma State University regarding his research to support LGBTQ plus youth. We'll hear from Dr. Christopher Nellum. Uh, from Ed Trust West, who's been our partner on a number of issues of equity. Uh, and then we'll have the opportunity to hear from Kristen Wright uh, from the Sacramento County Office of Education on the ways that we should also consider the needs of disabled students as it relates to diversity in textbooks. So uh, again, panelists, just two to three minutes. We'll make sure there's plenty of time for the panelists to ask you questions so you can elaborate. Um, first up, uh, we welcome uh, uh, Dr. Korematsu. Well, thank, thank you, Superintendent Thurman. Let's see, my voice is gone, so, okay, there we go. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you for inviting me, <clears throat> excuse me, um, here because uh, unlike maybe uh, all of you, I didn't start off in education in my career. Uh, mine, mine was, uh, I, had a, I had my own business, so I understand business and what that means. Uh, and, uh, but it was my father who gave me the charge uh, to carry on with education about five, mo five months before he passed away at the age of 86 because he had crisscrossed this country um, talking about his own, own story and that of the Japanese American incarceration. And as I said in the press conference, I've, I've waited, you know, over 70 years really to, to, to be here, to be part of this uh, because it's an opportunity that I didn't have when I was growing up. I was born in Oakland. I, went, I attended schools in, in the Southeast Bay. And um, you know, certainly the, the Japanese American incarceration was not part of that story. Uh, the only time that came up was at the time of December 7th when the teacher would call attention to the fact that it was the bombing of the anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And students would, um, you know, on the playground and on the bus would say to me, well, you know, 
it's your fault for the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Go home where you, you don't belong here. And, uh, and so it's those kinds of experiences and misinformation that has carried on, um, you know, over the decades. And now we have this, this opportunity to really present materials and facts and story to students so that they can identify with not only themselves, but with the other students in their class. Um, you know, we're, uh, we're in a situation now where uh, we're obviously fighting hate in real time. And, uh, and the only way to uh, really uh, change that is through education. You know, prejudice is ignorance, and education is our most powerful tool to make change. We, we need to have these stories of diversification in our textbooks so that it's, students kind of can understand the, um, you know, the, the struggles and the challenges, but also the positive outcome uh, that they can share with each other, that they are more al alike than not, that their struggles in many ways through our ethnicities are similar. You may change the names and we may look differently but a lot of those, those struggles are still the same. And families all have their own issues. And by having these stories in, in, in textbooks that, you know, children love books. Have you ever, you know, when's the last time you just sat down and, and with a child and had them go through a book? And, and, and textbooks need to be more inviting. Um, yes, we need to have facts and dates and all that. But, but the stories that we can uh, also attach to those facts and those dates are important for students because that's how they learn and remember. They're not going to learn and remember dates, but they're going to learn, they're going to remember stories. And in trying to um, make a connection in this country of, 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 of in a diverse society is, is important for all of us to know about each other because that's how we're gonna make change. And no matter if we're addressing uh, climate or control or, or the environment or you know, any other kind of issue, we need to understand where we're all coming from. And that's what we get from textbooks. And uh, you know, I used to carry around textbooks, but in, in high school, and I, <laughs> they were awfully heavy. But you know, it, it's, they were important to me because books are, are a source of learning. And we want to be able to have those kinds of, of uh, materials that are going to be relevant. Um, yes, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's going to cost money. But, uh, but then the, you know, the uh, school boards and the school districts will be buying those textbooks. And also it's important to remember, especially for California, we now have ethnic studies. And it's, you know, it, as of 2025-26, um, uh, we need to really be pushing those, um, those curriculum, that curriculum and the lesson plans of ethnic studies, which is, 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 is so diverse. Because by 2030, as we know, that uh, a student needs to have at least one semester of ethnic studies in order to graduate now. I'd love to have more. <laughs> we'll work on that. But we had to start somewhere, right, Superintendent? So uh, it's, it's, it's important to remember that we do have to compromise, right? But we don't need to compromise, and we can't compromise on true stories, on facts, on, on including everyone. Because uh, th this, th we're not going to make progress in this country if we don't step back and really see what's going on. And it's, it's not, you know, we, we don't want to politicize this either. This is not about one political party or another. This is, this is about um, all of us. And if my, if my father were here, he would say, um, uh, you know, to, uh, to stand up for, for what is right and, uh, and don't be afraid to speak up. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kuramatsu, uh, for standing up for what's right, and let's hope our students now don't have to wait 70 years, uh, as you have indicated. And you did that right on time, Dr. Kuramatsu. Thank you. <laughs> Role modeling for the rest of us.
no hint, hint. Um, we're going to hear uh, from uh, Dr. Romsberg, um, and we're going to hear from uh, Craig uh, Pulsifer just a few remarks about what we should be doing to support inclusion in our books as it relates to our LGBTQ plus students. Wow. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Romsberg, and then we'll hear from Equality Council. Thank you, uh, task force members and superintendent, for the chance to speak. Uh, I come before you as a proud parent of two daughters of color. Uh, in the fall, my oldest, a San Francisco Unified graduate, is heading off to college, and uh, my youngest is starting middle school. Uh, I'm also a product of California's public education system. I've, I have a PhD in U.S. history from Berkeley, and ever since then, I've been a professor at Sonoma State teaching in women's and gender studies, and one of the classes that I teach is LGBTQ U.S. history. Um, I have been involved as one of the lead scholars working when the Fair Education Act got passed through the framework, through textbook adoptions, and through a lot of trainings and, and rollouts and things like that. We're fortunate, as you know, to live in the first state in the country to mandate through law LGBT inclusion in K-12 history education, to demonstrate through policy how it can be done with the framework as a roadmap, and to empower educators through textbooks and trainings that are aligned. Our schools, therefore, have the charge, the path, and potentially the tools to implement LGBTQ inclusive history education, and that's huge. Six other states have followed in our path, which is amazing, right, since 2019. The framework and the textbooks aligned with it create a lattice across elementary, middle, and high school that is developmentally appropriate at each level and incorporated into existing themes. So in second grade, California students have long learned about the ways that families connect to communities and how those have histories. Now they can also learn how LGBTQ parented families are among the diverse kinds of families that are the lived reality in our kids' classrooms. Right, so in educational theory, you probably know that this is the windows and mirrors concept. Uh, windows uh, provide students a way to see people different from themselves with understanding and empathy. Uh, mirrors provide young people a sense of self, family, and community in the curriculum. It says, hey, you belong too, right? Um, so LGBTQ inclusive history education is also folded into fourth grade California and fifth and eighth grade early American history. Students can learn there about gender diversity in various places and how it's changed over time. I think particularly of how it's a rich, a rich site for curricula there is including two-spirit peoples when teaching about indigenous, the indigenous past, colonization, and resilience. In 11th grade, which is U.S. history since the Civil War, students can now learn two aspects of the LGBTQ past, which span the entire academic year in different moments. So first, how did diverse LGBTQ people become a people, right? That's a historical question. And what historical forces have been involved from the 19th century to the present? Second, how has an LGBTQ political movement for rights and justice developed? And how does this relate to other political and social elements in the decades since World War II? So textbooks including Jose Saria, Polly Murray, Bayard Rustin, Del Martin, and Phyllis Lyon come to mind in this example. So LGBTQ inclusive history education provides California's young people windows and mirrors, but with LGBTQ youth, and this is important, we won't always know in advance which students see it as a mirror and which see it as a window. So that's part of why it's so important that textbooks make this history accessible across the state. Study after study shows that it's good for all students. For LGBTQ students, as you mentioned, and I'm so glad you brought that up, uh, it's a critical intervention for their academic success, mental health, sense of belonging, and safety, and this is all the more true for LGBTQ students of color. For all students, that same curriculum provides a context for understanding gender and sexuality as forms of social power and meaning making that people have navigated differentially across time and space. It gives them those conceptual tools and clear examples to understand that. Appreciating this basic social and historical fact equips all students to consider how it shapes our past and present politics and culture. Inclusive history education empowers all students to consider how LGBTQ people belong in our schools, communities, state, and nation. 
Studies show that LGBTQ inclusive curriculum improves campus climate overall and makes all students more active learners in connecting the past and the present. So it's good for everyone. Um, so today's teachers and districts can access high quality LGBTQ primary sources, secondary sources, and textbooks aligned with K-12's needs. This wasn't true 10 years ago, but it is true now. But they need your help. So California has been a leader. Keep leading. One, fund ongoing pre-service and in-service training. Lots of teachers I've talked to want to teach this content, but they don't know how. And in this time where they feel under attack, they're especially in need of that preparation. Two, incentivize textbook providers to incorporate LGBTQ history in grade, middle, and high school materials. Currently, the CDA only formally evaluates K-8 textbooks for framework alignment. Uh, this should extend through high school. Teachers need the right tools for the job, and all students deserve inclusive textbooks. Um, I will say as a brief aside, I've looked at a lot of the textbooks and some of them taper off after. Um, three, pass legislation to update the history of social science standards to reflect the 2016 framework. It's long overdue. And finally, when districts try to censor history, hold them accountable. I know that we're a local control state and that's wonderful, but that shouldn't allow ideologues to run roughshod over law, policy, and processes that are based in careful deliberation, public, public input, and scholarship-based evidence. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roseberg. I think you dropped at least three bills I heard at, uh, <laughs> ideas, and so I was counting, and I know our legislators were too. Um, we'll have one minute from Equality California, uh, the legislative director, Craig Pulsifer. We're gonna go to Dr. Nellum, and then we'll hear from Kristen Wright. Uh, good morning, Superintendent Thurman. Thank you for inviting me to be here this morning to give brief remarks on our, our work on this issue. Uh, Slam Bridger Burr mentioned Equality California and the GSA network. Uh, sponsored the FAIR Act over a decade ago. Uh, unfortunately, we know that implementing education policy across a large and diverse state with roughly 350 school districts is extremely challenging. Uh, last year, Equality California Institute published our 2022 Safe and Supportive Schools report card. This includes self-reported responses from school districts across the state on what they're doing to improve school climate for LGBTQ students. Uh, there are limitations to the data. The survey is voluntary and the data is self-reported, but it's intended to be a resource to help policymakers improve the school climate for LGBTQ students. Uh, the survey last year found that nearly half, 48% of school districts, had not yet adopted LGBTQ, LGBTQ inclusive textbooks uh, or other materials consistent with the FAIR Act. Uh, of course, we know many school districts are committed to inclusive education. Uh, but we're also now witnessing growing efforts to openly thwart existing law and actively censor curricula and materials discussing uh, a vast array of concepts from racism and the experiences of LGBTQ people. Uh, most recently, the Temec Temecula Valley Unified rejected a social studies program in part to erase from the history uh, the contributions of gay rights activist and leader Harvey Milk. Uh, so last year, Equality California joined the ACLU the California Teachers Association and many other partners in sending a letter to the superintendent outlining our concerns about these efforts and detailing multiple examples of school districts passing and considering these policies. Uh, very alarmed, of course, as all of you at the significant growth of this movement across California, uh, but also not just the impact on students, but on teachers as well. Uh, teachers across the state are being accused of indoctrinating and in grooming children for teaching even the most basic concepts about gender and sexual orientation and leading to very real threats of violence against school teachers uh, as we saw in Glendale most recently. Uh, so commend our state leaders who are actively working to combat these hateful attacks, uh, the governor, the attorney general, Superintendent Thurmond, uh, for sending a joint letter to school administrators at the beginning of the month, cautioning them against banning books and censoring curricula, uh, and really commend our state leaders for making it clear that censorship and discrimination will not stand in California. And we know that the vast majority of parents, students, and teachers stand with us. So uh, thank you again to all of you and looking forward to working with you on this issue. Thank you. Well done, Mr. Pulsifer. Thank you. Um, we're going to go on to hear from Dr. Christopher Nellum, Executive Director of the Education Trust West. Sure. Good morning, especially to our esteemed members of the task force. And thank you, of course, to Superintendent Thurman and his team 
for the invitation and really the foresight to have this conversation today. Uh, my name is Dr. Chris Nellum. Um, I'm from the Imperial Valley. I'm from Brawley, California, a place where textbooks were optional when I grew up. Uh, and I have the privilege now of serving as the executive director of the Education Trust West. We've partnered with the legislature for 22 years now to undo what we know are the deeply woven uh, racial and economic barriers in our education system. Uh, we're an evidence-based advocacy organization, and we're focused on students, in particular students of color. Um, so I'm very glad we're having this conversation today in California. It's a state, you know, we're a state uh, that often likes to think we're ahead of the curve. Uh, we like to point at other states. We like Texas and Florida in particular uh, to point at when they are not doing uh, what's in the public good. Uh, but I think also as Californians, uh, we need to remember uh, that often we're too quick to sing our praises. I'm often quick to do that. Um, but we're not in the clear. I think the truth is uh, the evidence tells us, and I'll share some more in a second, inclusivity in our curriculum is already lacking. And so we have work to do already. Um, and was just alluded to, um, we also have a problem in this state telling the whole truth. Um, I think if you all look at school board agendas in your districts and communities, uh, what happened in Temecula um, uh, is um, being attempted all over our state, so not just Texas and Florida. And so one of the things that we think about when we look at whether or not the education system is uh, living up to its uh, public promise um, is achievement data. It's not the only data, but 16% of our black um, uh, students are on grade level in math, 16%. Uh, only a fifth of Latino students, the majority of our state, are at grade level. And so some may say the pandemic caused this, but those numbers didn't look much better in 2019. So we have a problem. We have work to do. One of the things that we think is important um, to advance that work uh, is to look at curriculum. The evidence is clear um, that inclusivity and diversity in curriculum um, support student learning. Um, I had some notes on mirrors and um, windows, so I can skip that. Uh, and I will continue on to say that the research is clear um, that um, diverse materials are good for student engagement, um, good for content knowledge gains, um, and also comprehension, things that we would want our young people to be doing and thinking about, particularly post-pandemic. And so as I wrap up and try to stay in my time to help the superintendent keep us moving, um, I wanted to share some data um, from a soon-to-be-released report that the Education Trust, um, some research we did. Um, one of the things that we found um, when looking at curriculum materials is, of course, we need to look at authorship. Um, authorship um, influences not only the frequency of depictions um, in material, but the nature of those portrayals. Uh, so in that study, we found that in hundreds of, hundreds of textbooks, including in California, um, those books are 6.6 .6 more times likely to be authored by white, white, white authors, and that white people are represented as characters in those books far often than other people, including people of color. Um, we also found, though, that textbooks is not just about making sure people are present. It's not about just about frequency of um, representation. Uh, we found that um, white characters are more often to have agency um, in those um, textbooks, they're more likely to have influence and which minimizes the role um, of people of color in those textbooks. And so while um, authors um, often are portraying people of color, in addition, white authors often portray people of color with drawing on negative stereotypes, which we believe is driven by segregation in this country. If you don't know people, you can only draw on the negative stereotypes that you know. And finally, um, I want to get back to just something I mentioned at the beginning. Um, or earlier, the importance of telling the truth. This is not just about history books. Um, as the senator said earlier, this is about art and history and science and making sure that young people understand the vast contributions of um, people of color. And so what can we do? Um, what can, um, including Ed Trust West, we plan to work you know, with our network of community-based organizations to drive local demand. We are a local control state, and so we hope that parents of color will help us drive demand for more inclusive textbooks, but I also hope that the legislature will um, communicate your expectations to the Department of Education and to the State Board um, to make sure that the approved list that come out of the framework adoptions, um, that the bar is higher uh, for inclusivity. Um, you all can um, certainly make those um, expectations known. And finally, I just want to urge the publishers in the room to not only think about frequency of representation, but how people of color appear uh, in your textbooks and curriculum. So thank you uh, for having me today.
Thank you, Dr. Nellum. Um, we'll hear from Kristen Wright. Kristen is the Executive Director of Equity Prevention and Intervention at the Sacramento County Office of Education. We thank you. We thank Superintendent Dave Gordon for allowing you to be here today. Um, if you could, just two to three minutes, and then we're going to get to questions from the legislators. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent, for inviting me. Um, I just wanted to um, amplify in this conversation disability as a diversity and a celebrated identity in California. And recognizing that all the diversities that have been mentioned so far, we'd be remiss if we didn't recognize the multiple diversities and identities students with disabilities represent, which are all the, dis all the diversities we just talked about. And I appreciate your comments about um, inclusivity and being able to see ourselves and our students with disabilities being able to see ourselves. Um, the intersectionality of these um, really is a, a piece that um, I think you all called out in legislation last year. Sacramento County Office of Education is working on an allocation that you put in the budget around inclusivity for students with disabilities who are also other identities of marginalized groups so that they could see themselves and they didn't have to pick one identity, they can rep be represented across their identities. Um, and so I'd also love to say that um, and unfortunately say that although we've legally ended segregation for the majority of students, we still are segregating students with disabilities in California at a pretty high rate, and oftentimes disproportionately are students of color and other identities. Um, we also have, uh, we're also in many cases um, teaching them in, again in separate classrooms and also with a separate and less rigorous curriculum. And I think the exciting part for me to be here today is to really talk about a little bit about how not only can we see representation in our curriculum, but that our curriculum goes to the full continuum of learners. So if we're preaching inclusion for all students, including students with more significant disabilities, that, we, that we're sending a message to teachers and educators that, that they'll have the tools that they need to teach those students. Um, you uh, also passed um, budget language this last past year that opens up the opportunity for literally every student in California to receive a high school diploma. It's pretty revolutionary language. And with that comes um, our students with significant disabilities who also have to meet the statewide coursework, course standards. So if we want them to meet the course standards, we probably also want to provide them with the curriculum um, to be able to meet those standards and also to be able to see themselves in the curriculum and also for their peers to see them in the curriculum. Because for a long time, they've been othered and those are the kids with disabilities in that classroom over there. Um, and more of an ableist attitude we've portrayed. Um, I guess the last thing I'd like to say is, uh, I'd just like to pose the question is, what if all textbooks both included diverse representation, but also was uh, representative of the, the multiple identities um, of our students and celebrated the diversity of disability so that when our students are coming in class, they really do feel actually included. And so I do believe our democracy is at risk when we allow our youngest citizens to be othered. Um, and I know we're probably not doing that intentionally, but it is up to us to be able to change that. Um, and you all have set so many incredible um, pieces of legislation and language in place to lay the foundation for this. It's now more a matter of making sure that we follow up with that and we help, um, we work with our publishers to make sure that they're also rising to that occasion. Thank you. Thank you, Director Wright. Mic drop from you and from all of our experts. That was a mic drop. We're gonna move to what I'm calling the lightning round. Uh, legislators will ask a question. Um, witnesses can answer one minute or less and um, so that we can hear from everyone. Uh, I'm gonna uh, start with uh, Assembly Members Burr. Uh, and then move to the left here to our center panel. I, I sort of have two questions. Uh, one is, um, do you feel that there's adequate tracking of LGBTQ SOG data in capturing um, uh, information about in, in our schools, one? Um, is there anything more that we need to do there? And then I think the second thing is with respect to the ethnic studies curricula, um, Fair Education Act, uh, other set, the sex education, uh, sex and health education. Um, what what do we need to be doing to provide more oversight to make sure that all of these curricula represent California values um, and are not being targeted to school districts in Florida and Texas, um, and that we actually have uh, are meeting the intent of the of the laws that have been passed here in California. 
Uh, Dr. Roseberg, you want to take part of that? Dr. Nell, did you want to take part of that? Part. Uh, oh, I'll take okay. the second part. Um, okay. And I'll say that uh, I think there's a couple of key things that need to happen. One is that publishers need to put LGBT content throughout the textbooks and not just at like one box in the tech. There used to be like the Pioneer Women was like the only place that gender was mentioned in the Old West, right? And there'd be that box on Pioneer Women and then back to the men, right? Uh, back to the white men. Um, uh, so I think that's a really key thing. Uh, and also that it's in the student edition and not just in the teacher edition. And if it's in the online materials, it should be in the print edition, right? Because there are going to be teachers who aren't going to want to teach the content and there are going to be districts that are pushing, putting pressure on teachers not to teach the content, but the students still have a right to, to have access to that information so that they can ask research questions and they can bring conversations into the classroom. Thank you. Uh, Senator uh, smallwood Cuevas, did you have a question? I did, and I, I wanted to piggyback on, on uh, Assembly Member Zaber's question about what can be done in terms of oversight. And, um, and, and I just want to say what a wonderful uh, task force, such rich information. Um, I want to start by saying that. One of the, the – and, and as you were speaking, um, um, Professor from – Sonoma State, I'm sorry, I can't see your, That's your okay. name tag. Professor Ronsford, thank you. <laughs> when you were talking about where these things need to be and how do we make sure, I want to go back to his question about the oversight. Um, too often we, we pass great policies, but how do they get realized? How do they get implemented? How do they actually um, uh, have the impact that we intend for them to have? And typically that means we need some sort of compliance and oversight structure. So. I want to sort of drill down on that a little bit more. And then lastly, I think you lifted up how um, le the legislature has been supportive, but what else can we do um, to make sure that we see this um, really important um, hurdle get overcome and that we have this sort of inclusive educational tools across the state? But I'll start with the oversight question. Dr. Nellum, did you want to take part of the oversight question? Sharing is caring, and Dr. Romsberg was happy to take the last one. Do you want to take this one, Dr. Nellum? Sure. I think um, it's a good question. I think I alluded earlier, it's not an oversight um, function uh, necessarily, but, you know, when we adopt frameworks in the state, there are approved um, lists that aren't binding, in, but, you know, districts are often adopting from those lists. Uh, the one that's most active right now is the state math framework, and then the next step will be thinking about what is on that list. And so my hope is that the legislature, CDE, and the state board and others will express their expectation that those texts are inclusive and have diverse perspectives. So that's not quite oversight, but I think it is a, a function that um, the legislature can um, provide so that we have more inclusive uh, curriculum. Thank you. We're going to go to Assembly Member Jackson. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Superintendent. I, uh, I, I'm reminded as, you know, as I begin to um, find ways to meet the moment uh, that history has called us to do, uh, that too often our very systems and traditions become roadblocks mm. to us meeting the moment mm. that we have to meet. Um, and those who wish to take advantage of our systems and traditions is the very reason why we are seeing so many inroads being taken. They have perfected the rules of the game and in many cases has even used common words that when we first hear them, we're like, yeah, of course. Like, uh, uh, like parent. A uh, parent, uh, parent rights, like local control. They are using these things in order uh, to target um, our most historically marginalized and oppressed populations here in California, uh, and to try to sideswipe that. Uh, we are beginning to, too many times our schools are relying on supplemental material to be able to teach the real history, to be able to do these things instead of, of it being in the core material. These are the games that are being played at the local level, right? And I heard it all the time as I sat on the Riverside County Board of Education and started wondering, well, 
why is it taking so long to be for our teachers to even have the material? And many times, teachers are saying, we can't even find the approved material that we know we should be teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, so California still has um, a ways to go to be able to do that. And I think we forget about um, all the other things that have been achieved in the name of local control, right? Segregation was a local control issue. Slavery was local control. And so we have to make sure that we don't get bound in these uh, rules of the game that someone else created for us. But if someone created it, someone can change it. And I think we just need to have the courage to do so. Uh, what, what else have we seen locally? We, um, uh, we've been focusing a lot on uh, my home county of Riverside County, where we have two school districts uh, who have uh, really caused the most news. But what other places throughout California um, have we begun to see uh, these things happening? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that um, we're going to continue answering that question. And the way we're going to answer it is um, I, I loved everything that you had in your statement. What I want to do is make sure that the legislators have time with some of the publishers. They're going to come up to this mic yeah. right here, and I'm going to ask each of those representatives just one minute, um, make a statement about what you're doing or what you're pledging to. Um, tell us your company, your name and your company. Um, come right up to the microphone right here. Um, one minute each. Um, just say your company and your name, and then that way you'll be able to get some questions from legislators uh, while we still have the witnesses present. Go ahead. Tell us, tell us something, Mr. Walker, about what College Board is doing to diversify books or what your pledge is. Absolutely. Uh, College Board is, first of all, committed to uh, educating all students. And so in educating all students, I invite you to stay right here in the front row so we can ask some questions right here in the reserved area. Um, we're going to hear now from um, uh, Elizabeth Coiner from CPM uh, Educational Programs. Just one minute. Tell us what your pledge is or what you're doing to diversify textbooks.
Thank you, Ms. Kuhner. We'll hear from Kimberly Plummer from Benchmark Education. Thank you. And we have the CEO of Studies Weekly, John McCurdy. Thank you. Um, Studies Weekly has been around since about 1984, and we're in the uh, business of doing uh, social studies, cultural awareness, science, and upcoming is exciting now is the new PK. But uh, Studies Weekly is committed to promoting equity and access for all students. Diversity is an asset to Additionally, all students benefit when they are given access to windows into full truth and value systems. That is our statement of action as a company. And uh, if time allows, we'd like to show you some of those two things. Uh, can we just have a round of applause for the publishers who are here uh, in the room? By way of example, I love hearing you say that's part of your statement of action, and I think I heard comments that are reflective of each of you. Um, what I wanted to do is make sure that the legislators had time to ask you all questions. If they did, uh, uh, some member Jackson, or, uh, uh, Chair Yersuchi, if you have any questions for the publishers, uh, um, uh, some member Jackson. Uh, I, I really appreciate the uh, statement of action uh, because my question really. Uh, to the publishers is the uh, uh, do you have you all adopted a code of ethics or a code of conduct um, in which um, uh, you all abide by as you begin to develop this curriculum would love for you to if you have please come to the mic each of you can just come to the mic and if you want to have another staff member that's fine specifically as a company have a policy and process that's in place when we do any state in how we engage with that state to make sure that we address even the nuances for that state because there's usually a state specific grade that we're teaching now we specialize in k-6 uh, opening new middle school in the next year but we think k-6 product primarily but we have a process defined that as we go through that pieces of it on not only the quality of the writing, the accuracy of the writing, but the representation. We have, actually, if you can see what it is, is there are, it is required that every student that we serve is in a publication. And every department has to follow that. And Thank you. Kinda, it's, been, it's been a blessing for us, but it's been so well received by our customers. Thank you. So our springboard curriculum is created uh, by teachers for teachers. Uh, we have a great footprint uh, here in the state of California, but part of the process, as you talked about, uh, we include diverse people as equal and active participants in all aspects of public and private life. Uh, we challenge stereotypes intentionally, and we go beyond the typical. Uh, we choose modifiers carefully and watch for descriptive words that are stereotypically applied to certain groups of people, which we think is very important. Uh, but in cases where we select a biased text intentionally, for example, and this I think is important, in an activity where the historical context requires knowledge of Jim Crow laws, uh, we are sure to provide adequate guidance to support teachers and students in critiquing the bias and also recognizing explicitly that the bias expressed is inappropriate and likely offensive. So we're trying to be representative of all, uh, again, that gets into the, the windows and the, and the mirrors. Uh, 
uh, show people in a refresh, refresh, refreshingly positive light rather than positive stereotypes. We show diverse people uh, empowered in diverse roles throughout society, use authentic, reliable sources for text and audio. We also cast voices uh, actors in the same ethnicity as the character without overemphasizing their ethnicity. Uh, we seek narratives that depict the strength and agency of diverse individuals. And we broadly represent diverse people across social and political issues. We also have some examples of you know, illustration uh, as was requested that we could also provide. Uh, but again, we do this with a committee, a group, uh, to make sure that we're representing uh, all of our uh, stakeholders, which are all of the students that, that we serve. Thank you. On to Seven Member Jackson's question. Thank you. Um, CPM's strategic goal number one this year is to identify and disrupt inequities within our organization and in math education within our sphere of influence. Our equity principle is that student unique uniqueness is an ap asset, not a deficit. And our philosophical commitment is that mathematics captivates with its beauty. It empowers us to predict the future and comprehend the past. Learning math is a lifelong collaborative and social pursuit. Equitably teaching math necessitates ongoing reflection on personal cultural biases, implicit assumptions, and upholding high standards for all students. It involves recognizing the impact of intersecting oppressions in the math classroom. Teachers need support. Thank you. Benchmark Education has innumerable examples in our instructional materials, stories, and images that represent a wide range of students and teachers found in the classrooms across the state. One of the things that we do is we actively involve teachers and other community members. We recently just announced an advisory board uh, that will be part of Benchmark Education, and they are educators, experienced educators um, from around the country um, that will be working with us to make sure that we are meeting the needs of the teachers as well as the students. We make a concerted effort with instructional resources and customized training to help educators level the playing field for all students, creating equal access to opportunities. Um, we're very supportive of creating welcoming environments in the classroom for all students just as they are. Um, I would also like to mention that we are one of the few companies that has developed a truly equitable Spanish English core uh, program, Benchmark Advance and Adelante, as I mentioned before, they're parallel equitable programs. They share the same program uh, <coughs> architecture and framework that support the pillars of dual language instruction. Uh, we're also very proud of our many collaborations with districts to develop authentic and diverse narratives that celebrate specific underrepresented communities in their districts. Uh, for example, we're working with Palm Beach County, a school district of Florida, to create a dual language program in K-4. Thank you. Assemblyman Mayor Jackson, did you have anything else on your question? No problem. Uh, Assemblyman Mayor Mirasucci, any questions? Um, I'd like to ask a question. Thank you, Assemblyman Mayor Mirasucci. Thank you, Assemblyman Mayor Jackson. I'd like to ask a question of the of the uh, publishing companies, and you can you can just answer it yes or no. Are you willing to continue working with this task force? Yes. Are you are you are, are you willing to help come up with some thoughts about what we might do for those publishers who aren't here, um, right? Because when Assemblyman Mayor Jackson asked you if it was in your mission statement, I thought, what a great question. And you all spoke to it, how it resonates in your company. And I think that's something to build on. Are you willing to work with us? Yes, no, maybe. Okay, I got a thumbs up on that. Um, okay, uh, are there any questions from any of the witnesses for any of the textbook uh, uh, publishers? Uh, Dr. Nell? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you had your hand raised. Um, so remember, uh, Bonta is rejoining us. We've, we've been hearing from some of the textbook publisher companies, they actually have described how they've um, embedded in their mission statements in their company um, what I would call inclusive um, goals and objectives, um, and they've talked about how they're reaching them. Um, wanted to see if some member Bonta, if you had any questions uh, uh, for any of the textbook publishers. I think I would just ask uh, you all, uh, one of the things that was just recently raised for us was the idea of making sure that in California, textbook publishers uh, have to essentially demonstrate that they are providing fully inclusive textbooks in order to be able to win the contracts associated with those publishers, with, with those books. I'm sure you talked about that, but uh, do you believe from a pure business standpoint uh, that that is something that you all are going to be intrigued by, abiding by? 
it's done today. Can you, can you come to the microphone? Absolutely. Thank you. It's actually done today in how we do present to districts. Uh, we have, uh, in fact, that's what we wanted to show you briefly for about five minutes in our slides was the very slides that we put up when we show a district how we do our diverse representation and why and how and to assure that it's going to remain there. And so at the point that I can show, if I could show slides, I have brought Dr. Carter with me and I was going to have her go through about five slides to show you exactly what we would show a customer that's trying to make that decision about whether to go or not go into the period. We, we can go to the slides, but if the other companies wanted a chance to address the question from Assemblymember Bonta, we'll do that and then we can go to the slides. That sounded almost like a request to the state for more information um, uh, received and accepted. I see others nodding their head. Um, and it is perfectly appropriate to use the task force to make suggestions from the field, from industry, uh, about how to accomplish the objectives that the state lays out. Okay, thank you. Uh, Assembly Member Bonta. Uh, just as a point of uh, background information for us uh, moving forward, what portion of your uh, market share or your profits uh, come from California? Great question. Uh, we welcome uh, any uh, companies prepared to speak to that. <laughs> Great question. Come to the mic if you want to answer it. Just say your company name again, just for the purpose of the members, and um, if you, however you want to answer the question. I was on the last question before you got to the new question. So what I would say is the California, we are very interested in working with California. As uh, we've gone through the review process as part of adoption, we look forward to continuing that work uh, with anything that we put together that is textbook that would be available to students uh, in the state of California as well as education. Got it. And while you're at the Very good, thank you. And I don't know the market share off the top of my head, but California is very important to this market. We could do a lot of different things for So we'll ask if you could, um, uh, for those of you who don't have the information about market share, we will ask you to um, research that and then report back. We, we don't always do hearings, sometimes we just do meetings and um, we take phone calls, texts, and tweets, and so we're happy to hear your information. <laughs> Uh, either a member have another question? I, I, I do. I, I have a question to uh, the companies who are represented here today. Um, a, a good friend, mentor, and coach, uh, Dr. Johnson, has made the point that I like that not only is it good for our students to see themselves represented, but it's good for your financial bottom line. Can you speak to that uh, while you're here in the mic? Um, reintroduce your company name and tell us what you think about that, that statement. Bottom line is student serve. Um, and so while I don't have revenue, I do have student serve. And so in the state of California, the springboard ELA, we have 240,000, roughly 500 students that we're serving in the state of California, and about 57,000 students that we're serving in math. That is in springboard uh, grade six through 10 curriculum. Just one that, for me, it's about student serve, not about dollars won. Thank you. Anyone else wish to address that question? Yes, the question is, um, do you believe it is in your financial best interest? Do you believe that you see it now in your financial bottom line? Uh, do you see a benefit as a result of diversifying books? These efforts that you're talking about, do they, do they contribute to a financial benefit to your company? And if they haven't, do you think that they could? Would you please reintroduce?
absolutely contributes to the bottom line of why people are undocumented. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's when kids are discovered. And we all know that from, um, and so I would tell you that serves my bottom line and that's not gonna change. That's why we are committed to K-5, but we are adding at our customer's request, middle school now, which is, and then of course the PK, which I mentioned earlier, which we're extremely excited about. Thank you. I'll just push and be provocative. I think there are some who think that maybe, if you look at the books that we've seen and we've heard from our witnesses today, historically, they've maintained the same images and the same stories for a long, long, long time. And I think that there are some who feel that that's that way because there's a fear to make a change and that there's a fear to show the diversity that reflects this state. I mean, 60 to 70% of our students are students of color. And so I'm pushing a little bit on this theme just to hear if any of you um, think that that is true or if you can speak to an example of where it's actually been financially beneficial, all right? It seems as though there'd be a market of people who'd want to um, purchase books that reflect the diversity, but we don't want to make assumptions. We want to hear from industry uh, what your experience is, uh, what your what your research tells you, and what your experience tells you. Our experience at Elizabeth Pointer with CPM Educational Program, our experience is that if we push the envelope and we do what we know is right, there will be some districts who turn us down. But CPM style of teaching and learning is not for every classroom, but we want to be there for the teachers and the students and communities who need us. So we're not afraid to take that stance. I really appreciate your candor there. Um, would you just say, take it a step further when you say that there are districts that will turn you down just so we're not making assumptions, why? Why do you think they'll turn you down? Well, we have students work in collaborative teams and we try to create a sense of student agency as mathematical experts as they learn, as they look through the window, see themselves in the mirror. It's not the teacher on the, sta on the stage, it's the guide on the side approach. And there are some old school learners who old school math with a lecture in the front didn't work for them and they want it that way for their kids. Helpful, thank you. Thank you so much. Others wanna to speak to this question or anything else? Yes, I would say that Benchmark certainly um, continues to blaze the trail. One of the things that we do is we continue our global collaborations with authors and illustrators from all over the world with our um, text. Uh, we have an award-winning uh, library called Authentic Voices. It comes in English and it comes in Spanish. And uh, as I mentioned, authors are from all over. And not only the authors, it's the illustrators. And then, of course, the stories, the content of the stories where students can see themselves. And in fact, just last year, we published a new series called Represent, written by those diverse author authors. Um, those titles accurately address challenging moments in history as what has been brought up today, such as the Holocaust, Tulsa Massacre, a Trail of Tears, the Selma March, um, Montgomery March, and many others. They also celebrate the achievements of inventors with disabilities, African American and Native American scientists, and many others. Thank you. Superintendent Thurman, again, John McCurdy with Studies Weekly. I will be completely transparent with you and tell you that it doesn't happen often, but on occasion we have lost business across the country because people know we support the FAIR Act in California. We continue to support the FAIR Act and we, like I said earlier, we're committed to it. Thanks but, for your candor. Do they ever give you a reason, those customers, for why they choose to it, not? Honestly, looking at human nature, I don't know if you're getting the honest answer, but you will get people that will say, well, if you guys are doing that, you're not being used in my school. Now, it doesn't happen a lot. I'm pleased to say that, but it has happened. And you just don't do business with them if they're going to do that. So a school board says we just don't want that product. Is that what you're saying? It could be a school board, but honestly, it's more usually more represented at a school level. I Got haven't it. seen boards do that a whole lot. And I know you guys are dealing with some of that right now. That's helpful. Thanks mm -hmm. for the candor. Some of you Bonte has a question, and then I'm sensing some movement amongst our witnesses. There may be some questions from our witnesses as well. Some of you oh, yes. Go ahead, sir. Greg Walker with the College Board again. Um, as we look at our springboard curriculum, a couple things important. One, our data shows that it improves classroom engagement and college readiness. Students go on to participate in advanced placement uh, at higher levels, so students that participate. However, the College Board will not modify our courses 
to accommodate restrictions on teaching essential college level content to students. We today, because your question was, what if we were to lose market share? Mm -hmm. If you look, there, there are several things in the news as it relates to decisions that we have made as an organization to do what's right for students, the content, and their futures. You may have seen where AP Psychology is under fire for students um, really having you know, topics taught about gender identity. Student that wants to become a psychologist needs to study that content. So while there may be some that say we need to take that out, it is essential content. And so we have made hard decisions at the college board to do what's right for content, for curriculum, and for students for their futures. And if that means a reduction in market share or revenue, we're okay with that decision because it is the right decision for students. Thank I'm you. gonna tweet that, right? That's okay. a perfect statement, right? Yes, sir. I, I want you to tweet that too, <laughs> but we're gonna tweet that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, yes. Assembly Member Bonte. Uh, this uh, primarily relates to texts that are not textbooks and uh, to really lower elementary, like early readers. Uh, one of the things that I did before coming to uh, the legislature was I ran several nonprofits that focused on early literacy. Uh, and we, uh, I spent hours at looking at probably hundreds if not thousands of, of early readers and with, with the intention of finding culturally uh, accurate, relevant, and in the dominant language of learners. In my district, I have, in one school district alone, I have about, I think, 32 different languages spoken. Uh, what we found was that there is a serious dearth of text that is available in multiple languages. Either you get a text that is uh, not accurate in terms of culture, but translated into multiple languages, or you get books that are not uh, able to be integrated by publishers uh, into the school district, uh, but are only provided in very few languages. So it's a, it's a conundrum, uh, a, a challenge that I think even for those school districts who want to be able to provide language inclusive and culturally inclusive uh, non-textbooks into their schools uh, to be able to have that. So again, to my um, you all are businesses. I, I, I appreciate the double bottom line intention of, of the business that you chose to be in, uh, but could you speak to the, um, the ability that you all have to increase the number of, of texts that are available that are language and culturally inclusive, particularly in the, in the early learning space, so in, in the primary elementary grades? We invite you to come to the mic uh, and share your thoughts on the question from Assemblymember Bonta. You'll give it a try. Elizabeth Coiner, CPM Educational Program. We're six through 12 mathematics, so we don't speak to that at that early level. Anybody wanting to answer um, to uh, Assemblymember Bonta's question? sound like I'm stating the obvious, but you hit the nail on the head. We're businesses, and it really boils down to resources and your ability to get those translations done. I mean, currently today we serve English and Spanish in what we publish. Um, there's a lot of discussion now beginning to happen about, you know, Mandarin. But um, it, I know the size of the company. I know the revenues that the company's bringing in, and we're growing, and we're enjoying that growth, but it's, it takes a lot of resources to be able to do that, and you can't just turn that over to Google Translate because it doesn't come through right, as, as you know. So we're doing what we can, and it, the markets help, help drive that. Basically, if I had a district come to me that said, I'm 90% and this is what we speak, you look at it as a business, so. So ultimately, if there were market demand and market pressures, uh, there would be an opportunity for you all to be responsive to that and where you dedicate your resources. 
Assemblymember Bonta speaks many languages. Clearly, she speaks the market of business and market demand. Um, um, you know, for a second, I thought our hearing was turning into an AI conversation. Um, I think that's a future conversation, but um, appreciate the question and appreciate the candor and the response. Um, legislators, any other questions for the textbooks publishers? Um, witnesses, any question for the textbook publishers? Um, I, I think that um, that you all, again, deserve tremendous recognition for stepping forward, for sharing what you do, and for your candor about what the market will currently sustain and what you will do um, in the face of that. Um, can we show our appreciation again for these companies? Thank you. For what you Thank you. Uh, we uh, committed to allowing for any public comment. If there's anyone in the room who wanted to give public comment, one minute for public comment. If there is, can you please raise your hand so we can recognize you and have you come forward to give public comment. Uh, public comment, is there any public comment? Seeing none, last call for public comment. Seeing none, um, I just want to thank the colleagues uh, here on the dais for your incredible uh, thoughtfulness. Um, can we also show some appreciation for our witnesses who really just brought it today? Um, We're breaking with tradition. I know a lot of times they don't have applause in legislative hearings, but I think you all deserve it. Um, this is not a one and done. We like you all to continue with us as we um, move through the various recommendations that have been made today um, and that we know are being made outside of this room for how we promote inclusive education. Um, diversification of books is just one example, but it's an important one, as we heard. Uh, we thank you all who are here today. Um, I want to thank all of our staff at the Department of Education, our communications team, our government affairs team, Dr. Torres, who put on uh, this hearing today. Uh, thank you all uh, for your work um, and for everyone in the legislature who allowed us to be in this hearing space and for this to be broadcast for those who could not be here in person. Uh, we had intended to be here until uh, 12. Um, please note we're ending a little early. Um, uh, I see a motion for adjournment from Assemblymember Bonta, a second from Assemblymember Jackson. Uh, we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>